Today, we are going to be talking about the biggest game design mistake, especially new game developers making when they're working on one of their first projects, which is which genre to pick. Hi everybody, I'm Christian from uh, Lazy Devs Academy and this is uh, our new thing that we're going to be doing here which is Game Design Corner. And today we are going to be talking about a problem that I really want to discuss which is which genre to be working on as your first project. So I've been teaching uh, game design for almost a decade now. I've been uh, tutoring new game developers through like dozens and dozens of uh, game jams. So there are certain problems I see coming up over and over again. One of those problems is just picking a really bad genre as your game jam or as your first game project. And this really ties into a problem that uh, I think a lot of people have with game design, where they think game design is something that happens, you know, you decide for a game and then game design is everything that happens above. But this underlying decision, which game to make, is not being considered as a design decision. And it's really a very important design decision because this fundamental decision, which game you're talking about, what game, what game you're working on, this decision has the potential to make or break your entire project. It's a difference of, of a really nice and easy and well done project in a nightmare scenario where everything just burns to the ground. So I have assembled five genres that I see new rookie developers choosing over and over again as one of their first projects and then failing horribly as a result. Number one, and this really hurts me because this happens a lot and I've seen, especially after my last tutorial, a lot of people suggesting it. Number one is platformers or jump and runs. Why are platformers or jump and runs hard to make? Why are people failing to make games when they choose to work on a, a jump and run? Well, first of all, uh, jump and runs have really difficult collision detection. There's really complex collisions happening between the character and like static geometry, but also moving characters. There's also this problem where a character should behave differently depending on how it collides with geometry. For example, with level geometry, if you jump on top of a platform, you should stay on top of the platform, right? If you're this platform and you jump on top, you should stay here. But if you're colliding from the side, you should you should stop not like stop ob above it but actually stop against it and fall down if you jump from the bottom you should stop and fall down like there's like very uh, important nuances happening here and the same things with interactions with enemies if you have an enemy and you collide with an enemy well it depends on from where you came different things should happen with an enemy especially if we we're talking about a mario clone so for example if you jump on top of an enemy the enemy should die but if you uh, approach the enemy from the side you should get hit but that's just collision detection afterwards there's still the problem of you have to make a lot of levels and jump runs are really good at burning levels like it's very easy to just run through a jump and run level and finish it and so you've been working on this level for two hours and the players can finish it in just a couple of seconds and then it's like oh my gosh i have to create so many levels to just create any kind of meaningful amount of gameplay a good test for this is you should take something like mario maker and try to make one good level in it and see how long it takes you will quickly realize that it's actually very difficult to make a really good Mario level that is kind of on par with what Nintendo or any kind of other big uh, jump and run studio develops. And that it also really takes a lot of time, even if you if you really have really comfortable tools to make those levels. And finally, I think a lot of people don't really appreciate how evolved and refined jump and runs are. So even if you get through all of the hurdles, it's very easy to come up with a jump and run that is really subpar and not really that exciting, even when compared with very old and very basic jump and runs, like for example, Super Mario Brothers. So just as an example, I'm going to be looking at three little details about Super Mario Brothers, which you might not realize or appreciate. Have you noticed that in Super Mario Brothers, when you press the jump button, you can control the height of the jump by, the, by how long you press the jump button. So if you tap the jump button just, just briefly, you will make a small hop, but if you press this for a very long time, you will make a big jump. And that's actually not that obvious to program. You have to like really wrap your head around a little bit about this. And it might be really difficult, especially if you're working with a physics engine like Unity. 
or like in Unity. So another little detail that's really great about Super Mario is that you notice that there is a small acceleration when you start running. You don't just immediately run at full speed. There is a small acceleration happening. The same thing happens when you change direction. Mario just doesn't stop and go immediately in a different direction. He actually makes even a small like a braking animation. There's like ee! like a small sound effect even happening. And then he starts running in a different direction. So there's really a lot of effort put into making Mario look as if he has weight. And then finally, there's like this little detail where blocks are a bit slippery, so they allow you to be not perfectly aligned and you still get past them when you jump against them from the bottom. So if there's like a little gap and you're not perfectly aligned that you will fit in this gap, you will can be kind of nudged to be, to be fitting in this gap. This kind of, there's like this fuzzy collision detection happening. All those things make Super Mario Brothers feel really good and if your game doesn't really have these little details, this attention to detail, people will notice, but they won't be able to put their finger on it. So you will end up with a game that's kind of like meh, and you don't know why. It will feel very disappointing. Okay, so why do people pick jump run games as their first game? And I think it comes down to one problem, which is a lot of people confuse familiarity with simplicity. Jump runs is something that they grew up with, something that um, they might be familiar with. Therefore, they think that's something that's easy to develop. So some tips if you are working on a, on a jump run and really want to make a jump run. First of all, don't. But if you really have to, I would suggest restricting the movement, maybe restricting the entire level to just one screen and make it get really complicated one screen levels. Something like in Load Runner or in N++. Another possibility is to pivot to a uh, endless runner, so something like Cannibal or, you know, I don't know, Tempo Run, I guess. I guess that's in 3D. I don't know. So something where you, you know, you see a character from the side, but it's constantly scrolling and you just press a button to jump over hurdles. That's usually easier to pull off than a full fledged jump run. All right, so the second genre that a lot of students or new uh, new game developers pick as their first genre and fail horribly is fighting games. Or I will actually broaden this to any game that has punching in it, that has any kind of melee, also could be also with swords. Swords are also kind of difficult to pull off. So why is that hard? Well, first of all, one problem is the animation. So animating things well, especially if there's like humanoid characters, is difficult to do. Also, especially in the punching games, the animations have to be really fine-tuned. They have to feel nice. The joy of the game, the fun of the game, is the good punching. So you have to understand how, how to make a punch, how to make a punch animation feel good. Good animation in this kind of case also requires a lot of planning that I see a lot of people don't do, and then they suddenly paint themselves into a corner. So one problem I, is I call being trapped in a sprite, which is especially the case in game engines that work with uh, sprites of a specific size, like in Pico 8, that works with sprites that have eight times eight pixels size. So we, I see students develop a character that has a certain size, a certain amount of pixel, let's say eight times eight. They fill the entire sprite with their character, and then they realize that the character has to punch and they, they don't know how to make the punch work because that means the character actually has to maybe be bigger because they have to like extend themselves. So imagine this is me and in, inside my character box and this is where the sprite ends. And suddenly I have to punch to the side and suddenly my character box has to get so much bigger. So this is something animators don't anticipate. This is also something that programmers don't anticipate and don't set up systems that can deal with sprites that are of different sizes. But then things get even worse, where you actually have to program very complicated systems that deal with those animations. So for example, let's say I have a punch and the punch animation takes a couple of frames. So it plays the punch animation and then the player presses punch again. What should happen now? Should this animation finish punching and then a second punch animation comes in? Or should this punch animation be cancelled and then the new punch animation starts immediately? Or should the second punch be simply ignored because you press it during a punch? There has to be some underlying logic that manages, you know, which animation can be cancelled into which animation at which point. Maybe there are some windows that you have to adhere to. And then things get even more complicated, but because to those animations, also you have suddenly collision detection attached as well. So if you're punching, then suddenly you will get, like, there's my fist going out. There should be, like, collision box around my fist or around my, my, <laughs> my hand that actually hurts the other characters, right? So suddenly you will actually have to set up some kind of editor where an animator can not just create an animation, but also set up all the collision boxes of, of that define how and where enemies get hit. 
And if that wasn't all difficult enough, there's a, finally a last problem of it's actually difficult to create a system that is interesting. So what I often see is that my students will struggle through. They will make a game that has one or maybe two attacks, maybe a kick and a punch and maybe a block. And they will start then playing this game against each other. Maybe it's a two player fighting game. And then it's just, they realize very quickly that just like mashing the punch button works and you always win and there is no strategy around this. So now then they realize, okay, maybe we have to maybe add some cooldowns. So they start adding cooldowns. Now nobody punches anymore and everybody kicks now. It's difficult to establish an interesting system that allows for different strategies that are still valid. All right, so why do people pick games with fighting in it, with punching? I think one reason is that it's kind of like the opposite of the platformers where people are not familiar with those games and so they don't really appreciate the depth and the complexity of those games. They feel maybe as if Street Fighter is really just about pressing the right combination of buttons to win, where, you know, this is a very refined system where all of the animation, timing, all of the windows are really finely balanced to provide an interesting challenge. Another issue, I think, is that um, people look at those games not from the perspective of a developer. They see two people punching each other. They see a screen, a background in Street Fighter, right? They see a background, two guys, and then you press button and some animations play. And they feel like, okay, I can pull this off. It's something that sounds easy. It's something that's easy to write on paper but it's actually quite difficult to implement. This is just for fighting games, but I also extend this to all games that have melee in them. Quite often making melee attacks is difficult to pull off. So my tips, if you really want to have fighting games, first of all, don't. But if you really, really, really want to make a fighting game, you have to plan ahead like there is no tomorrow or actually like there is actually a lot of tomorrows. <laughs> So I want you to play Brawlers. I want you to play Double Dragon. I want you to play Battletoads. I want to get into those games, understand how they work, maybe actually write down what attacks there are. Look at the sprite sheets of those characters. How many sprite sheets are there? How many frames of the individual animations are they? And then before you start working on a game, I want you to sketch out all of the attacks maybe on a sheet of paper just to see how big they are and how much space they take in. Finally, I would suggest pivoting to shooting at things. You don't punch people, you shoot at them with arrows or lasers or guns. That's easier to pull off. All right, third genre that a lot of students pick up and think it's easy to make, but it's actually not and they fail horribly. Adventure games, point and click adventure games or text adventures. So this is related to a problem which I like to call and then content happens. With that, I mean, there's a lot of game ideas that are very quickly explained. And the game idea also involves having a ton of content, but there's very little thought put into what that content is and how that content is being created. So why is making adventure games hard? Well, because there are games that burn content. That's something we're talking about when we're talking about platformers. With platformers, you sometimes get to this problem where you take hours to create a level, but then the player finishes in a couple of seconds. And this is especially a case with any kind of adventure game where you can just easily read through the text, but it took you hours to write this text, right? Adventure games are games that burn content. So we'll have to create a pipeline to generate tons of content quickly and efficiently. So I see is a lot of game developers underestimate that. They maybe think about the first level or the first screen in their adventure game they make that and they already, you know, two thirds through their project, they realize they only have very little time and they barely even began. It's just the first level that they made and they already ran out of ideas and they have no idea how to finish it. They planned an epic journey of going to the stars and saving the princess and then blowing up the death stars. But alas, they haven't even met the robots yet. So why do rookie game developers pick adventure games as their first game? Well, I think it comes down to this problem that I think a lot of people are scared of game mechanics or rules. They feel like these are the things that take a lot of time or these are the things where your project fails because you didn't know how to program this. So they come up with something that is relatively easy to program, relatively easy to develop, like a point click adventure game. And then they don't really think about the rest because they think that everything else is easy to make. Content is easy to make. And then content happens. So what are my tips if you really want to make an adventure game? 
first of all, don't. But if you really, really, really want to make one, then I would, well, I have multiple tips. First of all, I want you to plan ahead your content. I want you to actually sit down in an engine like Twine and actually sketch out what kind of content you want to have in your game. If you're making an adventure game with individual screens, I want you to plan ahead all of your screens so your entire game is already sketched out a little bit before you begin working on it. I would also strongly suggest working in an engine that is specifically designed to create a lot of content quickly. So something like Bitsy, which is kind of like a low res adventure kind of editor, or something like RenPy, which is like an engine that is designed to make like these kind of like um, uh, dating sim kind of games. Both of these are engines designed to create, to pump out a lot of content quickly. And this is how you might be able to pull it off. Also, I want you to really think about the scope. So I want you to limit yourself somehow in time and space so you don't have to create a lot of content to create a satisfying result. So something that was very popular with browser games for a very long time were these room escape games where the goal was just to escape out of the room using like a point click adventure kind of game mechanics. If you're writing a story, I want you to think already about the ending before you start writing the beginning. So you know exactly where you're going. All right, here's the fourth genre, the fourth genre that a lot of uh, rookie game developers pick as one of their first projects and fail horribly. And that's the genre of RPGs. Okay, so this should be probably the most obvious one, but I still see a lot of people try to make an RPG as one of their first projects. And yeah, that, that's, that's really not a good idea. So what is hard about making an RPG? Well, all that we talked about above in Adventures, but also a buttload of mechanics on top of that. So we have to create a bunch of dungeons, right? We have to create a bunch of story. We have to write text and dialogue. We have to uh, create a lot of items that you can collect and, and interact with and with the different properties. We have to create enemies that you can interact with with stats and everything. And then, of course, when we're talking about stats already, yeah, we have to make stats and those stats have to, have to be useful. We have to have situations where you can actually use those stats. And also we have to make sure those stats are balanced. So you have to actually play through the game multiple times to see if you can actually feel your character is getting stronger, but also so that there, there is a bit of a challenge there. So you can just grind to victory very easily. Finally, there is a ton of UI that you have to program. If you didn't know about this, programming UI takes a lot of time. You have to create a lot of screens, a lot of menus, buttons to push. You have to customize your equipment. You have to be able to throw away things, look at the description of things, look at the statistics of things, see how your stats change when you equip different things, see your inventory, manage your inventory. And that's not even like the battle system. What kind of battle use system you have is probably something that's going to be involving melee or it's going to be some kind of menu based system that even requires even more UI. All right, guys, so I think you get the idea. Uh, but I think something that is more interesting to talk about is uh, why do people pick RPGs as one of the first games that they're working on? Why do rookie game developers like to pick very complex, overly complex game as uh, their early games? I feel inexperienced game developers want to create games that sound awesome on paper. They don't really want to commit on to projects that sound a bit lame on paper, but you know, usually you start working something simple, but then you polish it, you add some features, you find maybe something interesting that you haven't thought about, and then something that sounds really lame on paper becomes interesting. This is usually how it goes. Um, I think rookie the game developers don't really have the confidence in this kind of process. So they want to overcompensate and want to actually get ahead of the curve, so to speak, and want to um, create something that already sounds great on paper so they don't have to depend on the actual implementation to make the idea fun. So they start you know, adding a lot of uh, ideas, a lot of structure, a lot of rules, mechanics, stuff like that, that really sound awesome, but are in the end completely undoable. So they start, you know, they start basically writing checks that they can never cash in. So my tip, if you really want to make an RPG, again, really don't, don't, it's, it's a bad idea. But if you really, 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 really want to make an RPG, maybe there's an RPG inside of you that really just you need to get out of you, uh, then I would definitely recommend using an RPG engine. So something like an RPG maker. They are really designed to make those games. They have a, a lot of systems in place that you then don't have to reinvent from scratch. So that's probably the only way I can think of, of how you can pull off these kinds of systems. All right, so this is the fifth genre, the final and fifth genre that a lot of my students like to tackle and horribly fail at. 
and that is tower defense games. So why is making tower defense games hard? Well, it's because there's a lot of systems that you have to program that are kind of difficult to program that take, take a lot of time. So for example, think of how, you know, how to you make a tower shoot at enemies. So there's enemies walking by in a tower, first has to like through all of, look all of the enemies, pick one of the enemies, which one is the best one to shoot at right now. Then it has to shoot a projectile. That projectile has to move across the screen to the enemy has to hit the enemy, it has to be shot, shot in the right direction to hit the enemy, maybe even follow the enemy if, if the enemy is already moving. Then once the projectile hits the enemy, the enemy has to react. There should be an UI showing uh, how much health the enemy has. There's a lot of systems that you have to program in there. And I'm not even talking about more complicated stuff like pathfinding. And again, there's a lot of UI. UI generally takes a lot of time to program. There has to be a build menu that menu has to explain to you, you know, how much a tower costs, what kind of stats the tower has. And then something that, I've, uh, that happens quite a lot is my students will get through all of this. Will they push through? They actually make this work. They make a game where you have enemies walking across the screen. You can build towers, the towers shoot at enemies. But what now? How do you make it fun? So there's a lot of balancing, very fine balancing when it comes to the tower defense games. How much health do the, do the enemies have? How many enemies are spawning? How fast are they moving? How fast are the towers shooting? How much damage are the towers making? What kind of towers are available? How much do they cost? There's a lot of numbers that have to be tweaked and you have to make tweak them so it's not obvious. So it's not like you beat the game at first try. But you also don't want to make it so it's so difficult that only a very specific combination of towers solves the, the level. You want to have something in between and it's super difficult to hit that sweet spot. Okay, so why I think people choose tower defense games as the first game? And I think it, we go back to the very first genre that we talked about, platformers, where it's like, I think a lot of people grew up with tower defense games. It seems like a very basic genre. It seems like a genre that a lot of people are familiar with. So they think it's easy to develop it. It might seem also easier to work on this because you don't control anything directly. Things are happening on the screen and you just you know click a little bit, but you don't control anything directly. So it seems like maybe this hands-off approach makes the game easier to develop. So what would I suggest if you want to really make a tower defense game? First of all, don't. But if you really want to make a tower defense game, then again, as with brawlers and stuff like that, I want you to play a bunch of tower defense games and plan ahead. Try to find out how the balancing works of those tower defense games uh, in order to make them fun. What kind of towers are available? What are the stats of the towers? What kind of enemies are available? What kind of variation happens? What happens after the first level? How do they mix things up? How do they make players think differently about their... Uh, the strategies. All right, so we are through here. My five genres. This is my five genres that you should be avoiding as a rookie game developer. Platformers or jump and runs, brawlers or any kind of fighting game or game where you hit people with weapons or, or with fists, adventure games, RPGs, and finally tower defense games. All right, guys, so this is it. This is my first game design corner, maybe a little bit long, but this is something I was sitting on, that's something I really want to get out. So let me know what you think. Let me also know what kind of topic I should talk about in the future. And also don't worry, just because I, I called out those five different genres that are not good genres to begin games with, that doesn't mean that I won't be developing these genres uh, as tutorials on this channel on the contrary so yeah guys see you next time around and as always bye bye